Well, hello everyone, and you join us here today to talk about something that's been happening in the watch industry that is crazy. Tom, you know how watches are generally thin enough to wear um, without sticking up above your cuff? Yeah. Or at least that's the idea. A few, a few manufacturers have been taking this to the very extreme of late uh, to, to create the thinnest watches in the world. And I find them rather fascinating. What do you think of them? Yeah, I think they're really interesting as well. I think um, traditional watchmaking as a whole, I think, is just generally noodling, isn't it? It is. You know, when <laughs> there's a new technology or a new advancement in an area, we've got, oh, this new ultra flexible polymer or we've got a really small microchip. It's like, oh, what are the applications for that? How can that benefit our everyday lives? But with watchmaking, it's kind of like, look what we can do with tourbillons and look how <laughs> thin we can make this movement. Um, and it doesn't really benefit anyone other than it just being kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's quite fun. So we are going to go back through some of the most recent and impressive thinnest watches in the world to lay out a little bit of the journey we've come along to get to where we are today. And the first part of the journey, Tom, it starts all the way back in 1975 with the Jusche Le Coult Calibre 849. Now, you might know that better, and more recently as the Jusche Le Coult Ultra Thin Squelette. Why don't you give me some stats on that watch, Tom? Yeah, so that is one of the more ornate looking ultra thin watches in recent times. I'll say. Usually they're just striving for millimetres, but um, Jaeger Lecoult have done something ultra decorative with this. Um, there's skeletonization and all sorts going on there and it looks very beautiful. The whole thing is 3.6 millimetres thick. That's the case and the movement. The movement itself is 1.85 millimetres. Wowzer. Uh, there's... What? I said wowzer. Oh, <laughs> wowzer indeed. There's 119 components in there. 33 hours of power reserve, which is, you probably probably think that's quite low by uh, usual standards. And as we uh, check out the power reserves of upcoming thin watches, we'll notice that's a theme. <laughs> yeah, so in addition to all the guilloche and everything, there's four different versions of this watch, a white gold, a pink gold, and then the same again, but with diamond settings on each. And there's only a hundred pieces of each of those, so limited. That's also a theme. Well, this, this, these watches came out in 2015 which uh, is fairly recent and you think yeah technology has come on a long way um it beat out the piaget Ultiplano 900p by 0.05 millimeters which is the thickness of air yeah <laughs> but the, the most crazy thing is is that the caliber that they used the 849 sq is a skeletonized version of the 849 which came out in the 90s, which is basically identical to their 839, which came out in 1975 and was the thinnest caliber for that entire duration. And still is to this day, when you when you think about traditional calibers, is still the thinnest. What is absolutely bonkers is not only did JLC absolutely monster the thinnest watches in the world, to beat Piaget at that point, they didn't make a thinner movement. They just made the watch around that movement a little bit thinner. And while they did it, they put like nice decoration in, they skeletonized it, they did all this fancy pants stuff, which as you'll see when we look at some of these later thinner ones, they've really had to pair it back. Like it's the ultimate bragging rights to go, yeah, made it thinner, but I also made it prettier as well. Um, JLC are also known for making the smallest movement in the world. Uh, I think they made it in the 1920s, the caliber 101, 14, by 4.8 by 3.4 millimeters is basically a big pill yeah i was gonna say it looks like a it looks like sort of like a big tic tac like you might get one in the box and go cool look at that one i've won that's minty fresh so the caliber 101 is still the smallest movement in the world but if you wanted that ultra thin squelette it would have set you back anywhere between 58 and 75 thousand dollars a lot of squillonies um, but it's not all about mechanical, Tom, because the next thinnest watch in the world after that came out in 2019 was the Citizen EcoDrive 1. Yeah, the Citizen EcoDrive 1. It's one we've talked about before. Coming all the way from Japan with its 2.98 millimetres of thickness, so just shy of three millimetres. It's the world's thinnest analog light-powered quartz watch with a one millimeter quartz movement inside. Niche. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the world's thinnest piece of toast balanced on the head of a Mormon <laughs> in the rain on a Wednesday. <laughs> As I said before, power reserve is uh, often something that these ultra thin watches struggle with. But with the Citizen Eco Drive 1, if there is a light, there is power. This is an essentially infinite power reserve um, based on Citizen's 
uh, EcoDrive technology. 85 components in this watch, all of them made from scratch by citizens themselves, applying new techniques based on their own research and experimentation. So um, this is kind of a big deal for Citizen, and um, it's actually a really cool looking watch as well. So actual product size may be up to 0.22 millimeters thicker due to tolerances. <laughs> Maybe they're catering for a little bit of battery swell in the temperature or something, I don't know. If a bit of dust gets on it, I suppose that might increase the thickness by <laughs> 0.2 millimetres. Yeah. So it's almost it's almost biblical in its ability to last forever and be incredibly thin. Yeah. Um, and I salute them for that. I've, I've always liked the Eco Drive, a great way to harness the sun's power. But it's not the first very thin quartz watch that we have seen in the past. In 1989... None other than our favourites, Seiko. They made a quartz watch which was 3.36 millimetres thick. So just a little bit more than this. Mm. Um, the 9A85. And the funniest thing about that particular watch was that its movement's thickness was limited by the thickness of the battery itself. It had just a, a standard SR712SW button battery in it. Right. And that was the limiting factor for the whole watch. That's amazing. Um, but this Citizen EcoDrive 1 is by far the cheapest we'll see here. So if you want to get into some of that hot, hot, thin watch action, $4,000. It's a lot for a Citizen, but it's not very much for one of the thinnest watches in the world. Let's move forward to 2020, Tom. Piaget were a little bit upset that JLC whipped the crown off their heads for thinnest watch in the world. Piaget have been making thin watches since the 1950s. It's a bit of their thing. So they came back at it with the Ultiplano ultimate concept. I imagine if you were to liken the quest for world's thinnest wristwatch to a uh, scoreboard on an arcade machine in the 80s, it would just read Piaget all the way down. <laughs> yeah. Pia, JLC. Pia, JLC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, Piaget's most thinnest watch to date at two millimetres is the Ultiplano Ultimate Concept. This is made from a cobalt alloy of 167 components. It's a mechanical hand-wound movement um, with a traditional crown, which is integral. That is a deal breaker for Piaget, the crown. It is. Their rules around that are a little bit loose, as we'll get to, but it has a crown that functions in a way that is almost normal. It has wheels inside the movement as thin as 0.12 millimetres, and the sapphire crystal glass is as thin as 0.20 millimetres. I mean, that's... Those aren't even real measurements, Tom. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, it took four years to produce a prototype. And it has amazing finishing, much like the JLC. Uh, it's got beveled bridges, circular satin brushed back, sunburst satin brushed bridges, circular or sunburst brushed wheels, grey coloured screws as well, it notes. Um, I guess that was worth, worthy of note. But. And what also is interesting about this is one of the themes of ultra thin watches is they're often highly limited. You know, very, very few pieces are made. But mm -hmm. Piaget's Ultiplano Ultimate Concept is not. And in fact, with Piaget's style selector, there's up to 10,000 possibilities available with uh, with personalization and customization available. Um, so you can create your own, have it your way, all that good stuff. Amazing. <laughs> I imagine that usually when they limit it to however many pieces, it's less to do with the exclusivity and more to do with dealing with the warranty repairs when they all come back um, bent into various different shapes. So the fact that Piaget are like, no, have at it, we'll make as many as you like, is, yeah. uh, is pretty telling to their, their confidence in their product. Yeah. Witness the thinness. We can do this. We can get down with the thinness whenever you want. <laughs> So this watch, one of the reasons they were able to make it so thin is by reinventing the way a watch is constructed. Usually you have a bit of a sandwich. You've got the case on one side, you've got the crystal, and then on the other side, you've got the case back. And here they did away with the case and case back and made them one and the same. And the movement is actually built from the front in. So when they seal the crystal, it is a sealed thing. They, they can't, they have to take the crystal back out again to get back in it. And that reduced a, a lot of that thickness. And in, in doing so, to make that case back thin enough, they had to make it out of that cobalt alloy. So it wasn't, it didn't bend. The first question everyone asked them was, does it, does it bend? And they, they said, no, 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 it doesn't bend. 
Uh, I don't know if they were holding their hands behind their back with their fingers crossed at the time, but I've not seen any bent watches. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the material, the cobalt alloy, is so hard that they actually had to upgrade all of their machines because it was busting up their equipment wow. with its uh, with its difficultness to machine. Um, but but not only that, they, they came across a bunch of different problems that, they, that no one has ever experienced before. And one of my favourites is... Without the crystal in, they timed the watch and it was running perfectly. They put the crystal in and it was running fast. And they took the crystal out and it was running fine. And they were like, what is going on? And the balance wheel was running so close to the crystal that it was creating an electrostatic charge against it, which was binding the hairspring and making it run faster. So they had to then put an electrostatic coating on the inside, presumably a Mr. Sheen or something like that, to, to stop that electrostatic charge building so the watch would continue to run as normal with the crystal in place. That's the sort of problem that you uh, would never foresee, is it, until you embark on a crazy project? <laughs> yeah. Anyone who's ventured into DIY without knowing what they're doing would understand the mantra, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And <laughs> that was a territory Piaget were playing in at the time. Yeah. Take it apart again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Back to formula. But what, as you said, Tom, what was really important was that it still functioned as a traditional watch. So hours and minutes still sit on the same dial. The crown still turns as you expect. Granted, they do supply you with a little motorised crown doodle to wind and uh, to wind it up every day because otherwise it'd be a complete pain in the butt but in theory on paper it still functions as you'd expect that's just more of a flaw of the human fingers than uh, than anything to do with piaget's engineering i would say <laughs> if you do want one of these watches tom and you can have one if you've got four hundred thousand dollars to spend ah little pro little fly in the uh, very expensive whale dropping ointment there. Oh, well. well, what's next? Well, let's move on to March of 2022 when Bulgari were like, hello, we've been doing watches that are interesting within our Octo collection that are thin. They've been racking up thinnest tourbillon, thinnest automatic watch, thinnest perpetual calendar. Mm. But they wanted to have the thinnest watch ever in the whole wide world. And so they came up with the Octo Finissimo Ultra. So now, sub 2mm thickness for a watch, 1.8mm thick for the Octo Finissimo Ultra. Uh, with its sandblasted titanium case, it uses the case back as the main plate again. And 50 hours of power reserve, so not bad, Bulgari, you've done pretty well there. <laughs> Probably the most striking thing about it when you look at it is the unique QR code engraved on the barrel's ratchet with freaking lasers. Is that so you can take a picture through the jeweler's window and book an appointment? I've no idea. Bulgari says it offers the ability to connect to an NFT and the metaverse, bridging the mechanical world with that of the digital dimension. Pretty cool or, or dumb, depending how you want to look at it. <laughs> Maybe you can display the NFT on your Tag Heuer Connected, which is built for NFT displays. I'm too old for this shit. Limited to 10 pieces, so Bulgari were just so worn out that they could only make 10 of these. Um, that's how crazy a watch it is. As you mentioned, this uses the case back as the base plate again, um, which on the Bulgari website they refer to as genius. So credit where it's due to Piaget, thank you. Maybe they forgot that they didn't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> this is my idea. This is your idea. This is my idea. Um, the the calibre BVL-180 actually has three more components than the Ultra Plano Ultimate Concept, so to get thinner they needed more pieces, and um, I'll explain some of that for you now. To get the thinness they have separated the hours and minutes, which is a no-no for Piaget. They've also separated the crown function, so you don't wind and set with the same crown. They have split those apart, because the mechanisms require layering and sitting them side by side makes it easier. So there's one crown which winds the movement and then the other one which you can set with. The mechanism does mean that you can only move and set the hours and minutes forwards, not backwards, but meh. But the main thing they've done here is instead of having what is typically found on most watches and indeed the Piaget, a 90 degree change in the gearing so the crown turns one way and the mechanism turns the other way, they have kept those two crowns on the same plane which means you don't have that change in direction, which is a big part of securing that extra 0.2 millimetres. So to get the thinnest watch, you have to separate out those two functions and put them on their side in line with the rest of the movement. Profit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so talking of profit, 
$440,000. So the only thing that hasn't become slimmer than the Piaget is the wedge of cash that you will need to buy the thing. God. And do, do you care to hazard a guess of how much waterproofness you get with this watch? 30 meters? Well, that's, that's a good guess. The, the Piaget is 20 meters of water resistance. Bulgari proudly list the Octo Finissimo Ultra on the website as having zero meters of water resistance. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> they felt <laughs> obligated to tell you that. That's fair enough. Yeah. Well, don't don't swim with your $440,000 thinnest watch in the world. Except, I'm sorry to tell you, Tom, but as of July this year, it is no longer the thinnest watch in the world because we now have the Richard Mille RM UP01. Yes. So, yeah, when they came along with a 1.75 millimeter watch um, in collaboration with Ferrari, it took everyone by surprise. The movement thickness is 1.18 millimeters thick and it's got 10 meters of water resistance. So um, it beats Bulgari there by 10 meters of water resistance. A power <laughs> reserve of 45 hours, just 150 pieces in existence. Uh, so very limited again. Engineers from Audemars PK and uh, Richard Mille developed this, uh, the movement inside, and they made a lot of it from titanium, and the case is grade five titanium for added strength, the base plate and bridges, and all of it's titanium. And again, um, following on from the, uh, the profitable model of separate your winding and time setting functions, uh, they've done that again with uh, some function selector switches for winding and time setting. So yeah, and it's a really interesting looking watch. There's not really much else that looks like it. Yeah, they've, they've gone for the executive credit card model there, haven't they? Yeah. And what's really interesting to me is how much they've actually returned to some of the traditional nature of telling the time. So the hours and the minutes are back stacked on top of each other. But what they've done very cleverly is to turn the hour hand uh, into the dial. So it's printed and then the wheel above it is the minute hand to try and keep that slimness down. But really what they've done here to get that extra 0.5 millimeters of cigarette paper thinness is to uh, update the way the escapement works. A normal traditional escapement doesn't really need to worry too much about mega thinness and so it has layering going on. Just small pieces here and there like the, the little pivots that hold something down or some pins that keep it in place. And for the escapement here, it's, it's quite an unusual shape where they've moved out the pivot for the pallet fork from underneath the balance wheel, which meant that the pallet fork itself, the lever arm, has to then extend from its side, which is then banked uh, to stop it from going left and right too far by the base plate itself instead of pins, which allows the balance wheel to get in really close to the movement to save that extra space. It's not just a great big advertisement for Ferrari. They've actually gone to the effort with AP, who are unknown for just doing crazy stuff like this, to to reinvent the way a movement works slightly to get that extra performance. Yeah, no, I I, w I would have done something very similar, I think, when it comes to uh, yeah the, the, the escapement there. So um, you're like, oh, I was just going to say that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Richard Neal. Yeah. Oh, can we uh, can we drastically reduce the guard pin and the safety roller and create a new part that does both by resituating the banking function onto the anchor fork? I was just about to say that. <laughs> Um, they've also split the crown functions, but this time slightly differently. Instead of winding and setting being separate, it's choosing your function and then activating that function, which is something that the AP lot have done in some of their concept watches in the past. You've got winding, neutral and setting as something else to adjust it with. Again, human fingers are going to fall short, I think. Yeah, there is a, there is a tool. And, and I don't just mean the owner. I mean, it comes with a pen-like device that goes into the slot and you, you wind it like that. Good, yeah. I mean, for the money, it should come with a free pen-like device. What is the money on this, by the way? Um, all of it, pretty much. Um, you could buy the rest of the watches in this list and have quite a lot of money left over if you chose to. Wow. <laughs> this is $1.75 million. God, that's a lot, isn't it? How much is the thinnest Ferrari? <laughs> I'm not sure that's a measure of performance when it comes to cars, but maybe it should be, Tom. The car's not going for that. <laughs> I think you're talking about a magic carpet. <laughs> yeah. So there you have it. The thinnest watches in the world. Um, please do like, comment and subscribe. Tell us if you enjoyed this episode, because Tom and I are um, very delicate human beings and we need your reassurance. And until next time, we will see you later. Goodbye. Bye-bye.